Hebrews chapter 9. We'll begin there this morning in Hebrews chapter 9. Last week we talked about the blood of Jesus Christ and the power. And the title of the message is, if I had one sermon to preach, and uh, this is part two. I should say this is part 2A. Next week we have part 2B <laughs> as we talk about the second coming of Christ. Follow it with me as I begin reading in uh, Hebrews and we'll be in chapter 9 and verse 22. We'll pick up last week we did the first part of the chapter. We dealt with the high priest that entered into the Holy of Holies and he offered sacrifice to God and uh, the picture of the power of the blood of Jesus Christ. And verse 22 says, And according to the law, almost all things are purified with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there's no remission. Therefore it was necessary that the copies of the things in heavens should be purified with these, but heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true, but in the heaven itself now appear in the presence of God for us. Picture the Old Testament priest, the high priest going in and sacrificing. It was a copy of what Jesus has done for us in heaven. Not that he should offer himself often, verse 25, as the high priest enters the most holy place every year with the blood of another. He then would have to suffer often since the foundation of the world. Jesus doesn't do what the high priest did, but now once in the end of the ages... He's appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And is it appointed for men to die once, but after this the judgment. So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. And to those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. The writer of Hebrews draws the natural conclusion about the work of Christ and the high priest entering into the Holy of Holies and coming out again with the picture of the second coming of Jesus Christ. Do you notice the, uh, the tremendous appearings of Christ in verse 26? Uh, he had suffered uh, to suffer since the foundation of the world, but now once at the end of the ages he's appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. That's his first appearing. In verse 24, he, uh, Christ did not enter the holy places made with hands, copies of the true, but in heaven itself to appear in the presence of God for us. He appears before God today as our advocate. And then in verse 28, it refers to his second coming. So it's a picture of what had taken place uh, with the high priest, a high priest coming out of the sacrifice after he had offered the sacrifice for the children of Israel to see it was accepted by God. Uh, the, those that wait upon the Lord, it's a, a term that's used seven times in the New Testament. It's a term that is referring to the, to the fact that we are not in uh, expectation of judgment when Christ comes, but the idea it's the fulfillment of his promise that he's given that he will come again. And then I like the statement that John MacArthur makes in his notes about the high priest. He said, when the high priest appeared, they, the children of Israel, knew that the sacrifice on their half had been accepted by God. In other words, when the high priest came out after offering the blood sacrifice in the Holy of Holies, God didn't strike him dead. He came out, and so it was the appearance that God had accepted what the high priest had offered. And MacArthur goes on and says, in the same way, when Christ appears at his second coming, it will be a confirmation that the Father has been fully satisfied with the Son's sacrifice on behalf of the believers, end quote. So today I'm going to speak to you about the second coming of Jesus Christ. Let me say a couple things first of all. I do not believe it is emphasized enough. Perhaps one of the reasons that it's not is there are so many things that of which we are not sure. Uh, there are some things as we get into the Revelation, as we get into Daniel, we get into Ezekiel, we get into uh, Zechariah, that there are some things that, that are just not sure. People will disagree on the timing of the coming, but whatever the case, it ought not prevent us from proclaiming the truth that Jesus Christ is coming again. You know, this world is in a mess. This world is in rough shape. I mean, it's, you look around to our country, you look around to the world itself. Politicians feel they have the answer. 
If we'd only go along with what the particular politician says, what his party says, then everything will be all right. And if there is a, uh, a failure in that, it's because the other party, whatever the other party may think, the other party's fault. I think the, as we, there's, there's a passage in Scripture that deals with, with David leaving the city of Jerusalem because Absalom had come in and Absalom had usurped the authority that, that did not belong to him and he attacked his, his father David. And the chaos broke out into the city of Jerusalem. And there was a statement that someone made simply, why not say a word about bringing the king back? And I would say to you this morning that as we look at the chaos in which our world is, uh, we find ourselves in, why not say a word about bringing the king back? Because King Jesus is the answer to the problems that we may have. Secondly, people do not expect the second coming. Matthew chapter 24, verse 44 says, Therefore, you also be ready for the Son of Man is coming in an hour that you do not expect. Really, ask yourselves, when was the last time you really thought that this could be the day that Jesus is coming again? When is the last time you really expected today to be the day of the coming of the Son of God? You see, the average Christian does not even think about the coming of Jesus Christ. When we read about it in Scripture, we read and understand that most of the time, when we see, deal with the second coming, we're talking about Jesus coming with his saints to set up his millennial kingdom. So we understand that. But there are passages in Scripture that do not fit that part of the second coming. There, he's coming with his saints when he sets up his kingdom. But there are passages that deal that Jesus is coming for his saints. So how did the saints get to heaven to come with him? Well, we say they die but there are other passages in Scripture that tells us there's another way. Turn with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and we'll begin reading in verse 13. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13. Paul says this, writing to the church at Thessalonica, But I do not want you to be ignorant brethren concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe... And that word if in the Greek is a word of assurance. So we would do no harm to say for since we believe. For if or since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. Now stop there just for a moment. The Old Testament believers had an imperfect and incomplete knowledge of what happens when a person dies or at the time of death. Shiloh is a word that is used often throughout the Scripture, and Shiloh was a, an all-purpose word that described a, uh, the disembodied saint, uh, spirit, uh, the disembodied uh, state of both the saved and the lost. And so when we talk about Shiloh in the Old Testament, it's just a general term. They believed that everyone would die, and eventually uh, there would be a resurrection day. Matter of fact, remember when Jesus came to Mary and Martha after the death of Lazarus, and, and Martha met Jesus, and, and Jesus simply said to, uh, to Martha, I'm the resurrection and the life. Do you believe this? And she said, yes, Lord. He said, we believe this, and we understand it, and I know that he... I know that Lazarus will rise again at the resurrection in, at the last day. And so that was an Old Testament idea not completely understanding. The Lord Jesus Christ brought life and immortality by the gospel. As he came and talked about the death and burial and resurrection, all that would take place, that is the truth that Jesus gave. So we know today that a believer dies, he is in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. His body's in the grave, but he's in the presence of the Lord. So when Paul was teaching the Thessalonians about the importance of, of death, because what was happening, they were, Paul had talked about the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, and people were starting to die. So the Thessalonians said, what do we do about this? I mean, what's really going to happen if, if these people are dying? Are they going to miss this resurrection? What happens when Jesus comes? We're looking for that. Are they going to be part of that? So there are all kinds of questions that the Thessalonians had in their mind. So Paul says, I don't want you to be ignorant concerning these truths. And he was alerting 
the, the people at Thessalonica about this tremendous announcement he was going to make. He said, I don't want you to be ignorant concerning those that have fallen asleep. Now, he's talking about the body sleeping. He's not talking about the spirit or the soul sleeping. Uh, the body is a picture. Every night we go to sleep. It's a picture of death. Every morning we wake up. It's a picture of the resurrection. That's what Paul is simply saying. That is the comparison. The, body, the, the Bible does not teach soul sleeping. The Bible does not teach that, that uh, we die in our spirit and our soul and our body all sleeps in the grave waiting for the resurrection. The Bible teaches us to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So it doesn't deal with soul sleeping. The Bible does not teach annihilation. There is uh, no uh, end of everything at death. The believer enjoys eternal life, and the unbeliever suffers eternal punishment. Mark 9, Revelation chapter 14. The basis of the believer's hope is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So that's what Paul is saying, and that's why he's saying what he is saying. Verse 15, for this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain under the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. How did Paul know this was going to happen? He says, I give this to you by the word of the Lord. So the Lord revealed to Paul, it was not something he concocted in his own mind. It was something that God revealed to him. So Paul, whether it was by vision or uh, as, he was, as God gave him the inspiration, as he was writing and penning the word of God, we don't know. But Paul says this is something that has come. This is the word of the Lord. And then he goes on to explain that when Christ returns and the living saints will, will not have advantage over those that are, that are the sleeping saints. He said that, uh, that uh, those who are alive and remain under the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. Remember the concern that there were people in Thessalonica that had died. They were in the grave. They were asleep. But he said there's no advantage because you are alive and they're dead. He said they will not, you will not precede them. The dead in Christ will rise first. So the, the conclusion is that, that we look for the, the Lord to come at any moment, alive in Christ. What's interesting is that uh, in this 15th verse, he says that we who are alive and remain under the coming of the Lord. Paul lived with the idea the anticipation that Jesus would come in his lifetime. We believe in the imminent return of Jesus Christ. Not immediate, because it's been 2,000 years. But we believe in the imminent return, meaning that Jesus Christ could come back at any moment. And that's the anticipation that the Apostle Paul lived. And he, but he also said over in, in the book of 1 Corinthians, he said the idea that he may die, and he may be part of those that die when the Lord comes. Or 2 Corinthians chapter 4, he deals with that. Verse 16, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, the voice of the archangel, and the trump of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. So he gives the order of the things that will happen. The Lord will come and he will descend. He will come in the air and uh, he will descend and he tells us with the, with the voice of the, with a shout, the voice of the archangel, the trump of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we which are alive and remain under the, com uh, under the coming of the Lord, we that are alive and remain shall be called up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and thus we shall always be with the Lord. So he tells us the Lord himself will descend from heaven. He'll come in the air. That's interesting. We'll see that, why that's interesting in a moment. And he'll come in the air with the shout, the voice of the archangel, and the trump of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Now, he comes with a shout. We don't have any idea what the shout is. Some people have thought, well, it may be he calls our name, and we all hear our name. We don't know. It may be that, that he comes and says, enough. We'll talk about that in a moment. We don't know. But he comes with a shout, the voice of the archangel, and the trump of God, the battle cry, the trump of God, the victory cry, and we're taken home to be with him. First Corinthians, our first Thessalonians in this fourth chapter, is combating the no hope that some of the Thessalonians had. So he says that we will be caught up. 
in verse 17. Those are the, the dead are in the grave. We, they'll have, being alive, have nothing over them. They will rise first. Then the rest of us that are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord of the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Okay, Pastor, that's great passage of Scripture. What in the world does it mean to me? How can I take that and apply it to my I know that I shall be called up with the Lord. I'm a believer. But what does that mean to me? The Greek language is a colorful language. And I don't want to be too technical this morning, but I want you to see some things that are just, I think, that are outstanding. The Greek language is a, is a colorful language. And a number of years ago, probably 40 years ago, I did a word study on this Greek word in this verse 17 that means caught up. And we'll see that in just a moment. But just to give you a, a little background of how uh, the colorful the Greek language is, in 2 Timothy, Paul says uh, that, that, that my departure is at hand. He was ready to die. Well, we have that word departure in the English. The Greek word literally means loosen. And it's used several times to understand something. You know the culture in which it was given. For an example, that word loosen would mean, when Paul says my departure is, it's an ox being loosed from its yoke when finished plowing for the day. So there's, there's a freedom. So Paul says my departure is at hand. He said I have a freedom that's looking me in the face. He said, I'm right here. I'm going to be free. It's a word that's also used for pulling up tent stakes and preparing for a journey, getting ready. It's a word that's used for untying a ship, a ship and uh, letting uh, from the dock and being set for sail. It talks about unchaining a prisoner, freeing it from confinement and suffering. It's a word that talks about solving a problem. You have a difficulty, you have a problem, the problem is solved, and you're free from that problem. So when Paul said, my departure's at hand, the Greeks understood all these things categorized and brought together. We're, talk, we're, we're explaining exactly what Paul was enduring and what he was going to go through. So what does it mean when it says in verse 17 that we are alive and remain and shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air? The Greek word caught up is simply a word harpazo. It is used at least five more occasions in the New Testament in different situations that give us an understanding because of the colorful understanding of the Greek language. It gives us a greater understanding of exactly what happens when the Lord calls us up. What takes place at the rapture of the church? If, we, if, if the Lord Jesus Christ would come today in the clouds. Now, remember, we talked about the, the coming with his saints. We're going to deal with that next week. Coming for his saints, what we call the word rapture. The word rapture is not found in the New Testament. Don't let that throw you. The word trinity is not found in the New Testament either, but we still believe in the trinity. The word rapture is not found in the New Testament, but we find occasions in Scripture like this and others that give us an idea of what will happen. And we're going to focus upon that word harpazo. There's another Greek word that, that uh, helps us understand a little bit, means the, is somewhat the same. It's klepto. You kleptomaniac, you understand that word. Klepto simply means to steal, to steal secretly. That is not the word that is used when he talks about the catching up, the taking out of God's people. So what does it mean? First of all, it means to be carried off by force. Turn with me to the Gospel of John. We'll see an occasion where that is used in John's Gospel in chapter 6 and verse 15. Jesus had just fed the 5,000. And there was a, the miracle, and the people were, were astounded by what he had done. And uh, they said, truly, this is the prophet who's coming to the world. And verse 15 says in John chapter 6, Therefore, when Jesus perceived that they were about to come and take him by force, herpazo, to make him king, he departed again to the mountain by himself alone. Coming to take by force. Jesus, the, the, Satan, is, is referred to in Ephesians 2.2 2 as the prince of the power of the air. Jesus, when he comes again, Thessalonians says, that Jesus comes in the air. He could have stayed in heaven and clapped his hands or shouted in heaven and called us by name and said, come on up, but he didn't. He says, the scripture says that he comes 
in the air. It's interesting too, and I don't want to get too technical on it, but there are two words that are used for air in the, in the Greek, in the Koine Greek language, which is New Testament. And that one word uh, means, if somebody would stand on Mount Olympus, Olympus was 6,400 feet tall. Somebody would stand on Mount Olympus and they would say air, A-E-R, they would point down. If they would say air, A-I-T-H-E-R in the English language, they would point up. So somewhere in that mile range. What's interesting is when Paul said that Jesus will come in the air, he's talking about something within the mile over the, when it comes in the clouds, something within the mile of the earth. It's, it's the Greek language. It's how colorful and interesting that it is. Satan is the prince of the power of the air. Jesus comes again and raptures us out, calls us, catches us up. He comes in Satan's territory. Satan, the prince of the power of the air, and Jesus is saying, that's it. I'm coming, and I'm going to show you who's king. Now, we don't understand the battle. We'll not, uh, we'll not be in the battle. I don't know what's going to take place, but Jesus will come instantaneously. He comes in Satan's kingdom and takes us out. Now, that's pretty exciting when you think about it what he's promised to do for us. Second thing I want you to see, go to Jude chapter one. Jude chapter one, only one chapter in the book of Jude, but verse 23. The believers, in the, Jude is challenging the believers in how to live and, and what to do and so forth and, and what is their life and talk about reaching the lost. He says in verse 23, but others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire hating even the garments defiled by the flesh. So he's talking about believers reaching down and pulling out of the fire those that were ready for God's judgment. So the second meaning of the word hapazo is to rescue from the danger of destruction. Now I believe the church will be caught up before the seven year tribulational period. The church is never given signs or warned to look for the tribulation. But we are told to lift up your head for your redemption draws nigh. Philippians 1, 6 says, being confident of this very thing, that he which has begun a good work in you will perform it under the day of Jesus Christ. Now I believe that day of Jesus Christ will take place before the tribulation. It doesn't seem to have any other room after that. The tribulation is a time of God's divine judgment upon the earth. Over in 1 Thessalonians in chapter 1, Verse 9 and 10, just flip back a page. He says, for, for they themselves declare concerning us what manner of entry we had to you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come. Romans chapter 5, verse 9 says, Much more than being justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. I like again what John MacArthur says, Christ bore the full fury of God's wrath in the believing sinner's place and there's no uh, room left for him, end quote. Scripture tells us the object of God's wrath during the tribulation is Israel and the ungodly Gentile nations. If the church was destined to suffer, I would think the Bible would, would be clear about what is happening, what to look out for, and what to watch. But what do we look for? Romans 8, 23. Not only that, but we also, who have been the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. Philippians 3, 20. For our conversation or our citizenship is in heaven, for which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. I think the language is clear. The believer is to expect at any moment the imminent return of Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit, uh, the, the Second Thessalonians, speaks about the Holy Spirit as the one that restrains iniquity on the earth. You think things are bad now. Wait till the Holy Spirit is, where the Holy Spirit dwells today, the believer. When the, when the Lord comes again and takes us up, catches us up in the air in Satan's domain victoriously, the Holy Spirit is taken out with us. We revert back to how the God worked in the Old Testament times. And 2 Thessalonians 2.7 says, For the mystery of lawlessness or iniquity is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he's taken out of the way, taken out of the way when we're called to glory. The Holy Spirit leaves when the church does and all havoc is turned loose. 
harpazo. It means to rescue from the danger of destruction. We give you a third meaning of the word. Go to the book of Acts in chapter, nine, chapter 8, verse 39. Acts chapter 8. You know the story of the, of the Ethiopian eunuch and, and how he was riding back from Jerusalem and, and uh, the spirit takes the uh, Philip and brings him into the desert to witness to him and says, what does hinder me to be baptized? He said, if you believe and sure that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, you can be. And verse 39 says, and when they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord caught Philip away, harpazo, Philip away, so that the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. It means, thirdly, to be, transfer, to be transferred swiftly. That's exactly what we're referring to in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. We're caught up. We're transferred swiftly. Where heaven is, we have no idea. But our journey is not dependent upon distance. But our travel is upon the speed of thought. You think about Jesus. He's on the Emmaus Road, the, uh, the disciples coming out of Jerusalem, and they were heart sick because they thought Jesus was dead, and somebody took his body, and he appeared. And then all of a sudden, after he conversed with them, he was gone. Then he was in Jerusalem. Then he appeared in the upper room, and then he was gone. And that's the transferred swiftly. Let me show you another passage in 1 Corinthians in chapter 15 and verse 51, 1 Corinthians 15, 51. Behold, Paul says, I tell you a mystery. Remember, a mystery was something that was not revealed up to this point, but now is revealed. Paul says, I'm going to reveal this great mystery to you. We shall not all sleep, we shall not all die, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trump will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on corruption. And this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O grave, O Hades, O hell, where is your victory? Sting of death is sin, the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God that gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. We are transferred swiftly. Harpazo. Fourth meaning. Go to Acts chapter 23. Acts chapter 23. And in verse 10 of Acts chapter 23. Soldiers were arguing, or the, I should say the Sadducees and the Pharisees were arguing over the Apostle Paul. And in verse 10 of chapter 23. Now when they arose in a great dissension, the commander, fearing lest Paul might be pulled to pieces by them, commanded the soldiers to go down and take him by force, by harpazo, from among them, and to bring them into the barracks. So Paul was being torn between the Sadducees and the Pharisees, and the commander said, I want you to go in and claim Paul as your own. I want you to go in and, and take him to yourself. What, they, what, Paul, what the commander was doing was claiming Paul during the dispute between the Sadducees and the Pharisees. There was an anxious claiming. Years ago, I think it was our first year here, Jason was in the sixth grade, just finished sixth grade, and Ralph had just finished eighth grade, and so that next summer, we took a uh, number, I think there were 17 of us from the church that went up to the boundary waters of Wisconsin and Canada, and uh, camped out for a week. whoop de doo But we went up there and camped out for a week, and it was not uh, something that I love to do, but we did, and there were six of us in our group, and that's all we saw for the week, and we had our little island, and we had canoes, and there were two in, two in each canoe, and I had Jason in mine, and Ralph was with a friend of his, and then there were two other men, and uh, we, it rained, uh, well, we we get into that. But anyway, uh, we uh, uh, came to uh, a rapid, and our canoe tipped over. And, I mean, the rapid was taking us down, and my first reaction, I came up. And we all had our, our vest on. It came up. I didn't see Jason. I saw his vest underwater. And he did everything was right, and he was fine. But for that sheer moment of terror, I did everything I could to swim to him to try to reach him. And it was the idea that I was claiming him. I was reaching out to claim him for myself. That's exactly what this passage is dealing with, with our puzzle. 
that they were, the soldiers were going to Paul to claim him lest he be destroyed by the Sadducees and Pharisees. This world's in a mess. And Jesus Christ is coming again to claim us, to draw us, to bring us to himself. Our puzzle. There's one other word I want you, time I want you to see. That's the Gospel of John, chapter 10. Gospel of John, chapter 10. And in, read a couple of verses. Verse 12. The hireling, he who is not the shepherd, one who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming, leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. Catches them, that's our puzzle. Verse 28. It's reversed now, talking about the shepherd, talking about Jesus. Well, verse 27. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I will give them eternal life. They shall never perish, neither shall any man snatch them or pluck them, harpazo, out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no man is able to, to snatch them or to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. So the fifth meaning of the word is to snatch away or to rob. We don't belong to Satan. And so Jesus said, no man's going to rob them from me. No man's going to come and snatch them. Satan can't. There's the security that we have in Jesus Christ. He said, I'm the one that's protecting them. They're my sheep. I protect them. No man robs them from me. I think of the world situation. I think of the attacks of Satan and uh, through people and how they attack the very things of God and there's a time, and we don't know when. God knows, and it's on God's calendar. It's not ours. But there's a time that Jesus Christ will say, enough. And there's a time that he'll call us unto himself. And the Bible says, so shall we ever be with the Lord. That's the promise we have today. Where's the promise of his coming? It's been 2,000 years, they asked Peter. And they ridiculed Peter. Where's the promise of his coming? Lord's not slack concerning his promises. Some men count slackness. God's long-suffering. God's not willing that any should perish. But God wants all to come to repentance. Today's the day of opportunity. There'll come a time that you won't have opportunity. But today's the day of opportunity. Today's a day where you can say yes. Because Jesus is coming again. That's the promise we have in his word.